Welcome to Overthink, the podcast where we, two philosophy professors, talk about intellectual fashions and so much more. I'm your co-host, Dr. David Peña Guzman. And I'm Dr. Ellie Anderson. Philosophers, perhaps because they take themselves to be searching for the naked truth, <laughs> have historically expressed nothing but disdain for clothing. Clothes have been seen as trivial and frivolous and artificial to the point of calling into question the very intelligence of those who are interested in them. We see this hatred for garments in Thomas Carlyle's 1836 book, Sartor Resartus, which is just an amazing <laughs> title for a book. By it the means way. tailor retailored in Latin. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't even care enough to look <laughs> into what it means. I just Sartus Resartus. Um, <laughs> but in this book, uh, Carlyle. By the way, it's a satirical text. It's actually a parody of German idealism for those interested. But he makes fun of the very idea that there could be a philosopher of clothing. And in the text, he invents a fictional philosopher named Diogenes. Let me give this a shot. Tuffelstruck, um, whose <laughs> last name translates into devil's shit. <laughs> um, and anyways, he envisions this fictional character, this philosopher of clothes, who thinks that everything in the world and in reality boils down to one form of clothing or another. He uses him to mock the very idea that there could be philosophically interesting questions raised by clothes. Honestly, being a philosopher of clothing sounds pretty sweet. And I was delighted to find out that this book even existed. Although in making philosophy seem as silly as fashion, it's definitely perpetuating the idea that fashion <laughs> is silly. <laughs> and there's definitely a sense, I think, and it's not all for bad reasons, that fashion is superficial, that it's merely about the body. And this certainly has resonances with the way that philosophy has traditionally elevated the mind over the body, mm -hmm. as well as denigrated the feminine, since for centuries, fashion has been associated with women. And uh, I would say, and yet, obviously, philosophers have to dress themselves. And some of us, you and I included, enjoy it more than others and enjoy <laughs> dressing well, not that you could tell by my outfit this morning. I know, I know. David, <laughs> gets into the studio because, by the way, Overthinkers, we are recording in person in the KSPC studio in Claremont, mm -hmm. California. And David comes in and realizes that <laughs> he's wearing a kind of dated shirt for our recording on fashion Well, today. because I got dressed um, <laughs> very early in the morning when I was still um, groggy uh, before my coffee, and I forgot that we're going to have have picture evidence of our outfits today because that never really happens. <laughs> yeah, uh, so true. you're going to see what I'm wearing if you follow us or just check out our social media. Yep. Overthink underscore pod on Instagram, TikTok and Twitter. <laughs> anyway, OK, so we are not the only philosophers to be actually interested in clothes. In fact, are you ready for a few philosophers fashion stories? Yes, I am. OK, so there's a rumor that Aristotle really dressed well and was known for his signature style of cropped hair and rings. Oh, wow. Which I guess goes with the big nose because he's known no, for having a big nose. Aristotle. That's not Socrates. Oh, my gosh. No, I, I think it might be Socrates. Yeah, that's no, Socrates. Yes. Aristotle is the one that was like more um, um, like pretty with a big library. And so with a lot be, of rings. Yeah. So his his aesthetic is like dark academia, yeah. uh, fourth century <laughs> BCE. Got it. <laughs> Okay, there's also a story about the philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe, 20th century philosopher, who was taken out to a dinner after a talk that she gave and told that women weren't allowed to enter the restaurant wearing pants. Oh. And so she took off her pants and entered the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and yet philosophers have to dress and sometimes undress, undress. <laughs> themselves. <laughs> okay, next up, we have Hannah Arendt, who loved shoes. She was a collector of shoes with a specific passion for Ferragamo. I don't know what that is. Fancy designer. Okay. And then finally, Beauvoir, this one really gets me. Beauvoir said in an interview, I must tell you that I am not at all interested in clothes. Meanwhile, she was wearing a fabulous tweed suit and like nice makeup and heels. And if you read any of Beauvoir's diaries, you know, the woman loved fashion. She's yes. always talking yes. about like the dresses that her yes. friends were wearing to parties. She's like, oh, Zaza looked incredible in blue. <laughs> <laughs> well, and actually even the image that we have of Beauvoir, um, uh, that very iconic photograph of her gives the, the impression that she was very much interested in controlling her image. Yeah, but I think that's part of what's going on in the interview, right? She's disavowing her interest in clothes out mm -hmm. of an investment 
in being seen as serious, I would speculate. Even though at the same time, she's also invested in an image of herself as like aesthetically pleasing, perhaps. Well, and when I think about that, Im that figure of the philosopher who is into fashion, but wants to give off the impression of not being into fashion, honestly, what comes to mind is the 1950s existentialist mm -hmm. sitting at the cafe, smoking a cigarette or a cigar and wearing a black turtleneck. So it's interesting how some fashions get associated with particular philosophical yeah. movements even. Totally. I mean, the black turtleneck was iconic of existentialism in mid-century. In fact, just one last note, as we're talking about philosophers and and the specific fashions, one of my favorite movies when I was a teenager was Audrey Hepburn's film Funny Face, which is about this like nerdy girl who works in a bookstore and is passionate about philosophy. And it's a parody of existentialism. Uh -oh. I forget what the name of the philosophy is in the movie, but it's not existentialism, but it's very obviously existentialism. <laughs> and she gets discovered in the bookstore by a photographer, a fashion photographer I and an see. editor who then are like, will you please come to Paris and model for us? We think you're the favorite of, you know, the new phase of fashion. And she only agrees because she'll get to go to Paris and meet her favorite philosopher. This is actually <laughs> the only reason I have sunk two decades of my life into this profession is because I'm actually on my way to shaping the world of fashion. <laughs> <laughs> By wearing black turtlenecks. <laughs> yes, exactly. Today, we are talking about fashion. What do people mean when they describe fashion as self-expression? How is the history of fashion connected to individualism and consumerism? And how does fashion reinscribe class distinctions and the desire for superiority? When I think about fashion, I definitely think about self-expression. I think about individuals placing a high premium on their individuality, their uniqueness, to the point of wanting their outward appearance to somehow convey their inner reality. Yeah. I mean, you hear this a lot, right? That fashion is all about self-expression. And on the one hand, I get that as a lover of fashion myself. But on the other hand, I think we also need to recognize that much of fashion is about fashion that is about following and creating mm. trends. We want to look like ourselves instead of other people, but we also want to be wearing the right thing, right? Like I want this <laughs> handbag to, to express my essence, but I also want the handbag to be on trend. And so like, for instance, I wouldn't be caught dead in skinny jeans in 2023 because I am, I will admit it, a hopeless trend follower. <laughs> but this isn't because skinny jeans are bad or not me. It's just because they're out of fashion right now. They were you a few years ago. Yes. But, you know, given the plurality of yourself, Ellie, <laughs> the, you, the self is actually just a series of trends. Um, <laughs> but I mean, couldn't we say that skinny jeans are more flattering than the low waisted wide leg jeans that... For example, kids are sporting these days. OK, OK. So thinking less in terms of self-expression and more in terms of like the idea that some fashions might objectively be better than others. Yeah, it's a, a question about a possibility. What do you yeah. think about that? So I would say no. In fact, I've seen the idea of what's flattering change with every new jean trend. <laughs> so, for instance, when skinny jeans first came on the scene, and I remember vividly, David, the skinny jeans trend was around the time that you and I yes. were like constantly going to thrift stores, scouring the women's jeans section yes. together and looking for the skinniest possible jeans. <laughs> um, but when they first came on the scene, they were considered unflattering, right? They highlight every inch of skin. Um, every <laughs> inch of <Yeah>. the body. <laughs> well, and my dad, who is very into fashion, he's a former fashion model, in fact, would always say that skinny jeans make him look bad because he has skinny legs. And so mm. it's like making him look like he has bird legs, right? They were unflattering. <laughs> <laughs> but then once everyone got used to skinny jeans, then like they seemed flattering, right? Yeah. And then mom jeans became a thing, the high-waisted jeans that were a little bit baggier. And everyone was saying, saying then that mom jeans were unflattering because they make people look like they're wearing a diaper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I wonder whether it's actually the fashion that changes our perception of beauty in relation to bodies, because then like with yeah. skinny jeans, like my chicken legs are in. Mm -hmm, but like totally. now with the baggy ones, my chicken legs are like I can't show them to the world in the plenitude of their 
meagerness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it's somehow our perception changes such that it no longer seems flattering, right? And so now that high waisted jeans are mainstream, people think they make butts look great. We no longer have that diaper rhetoric and so <laughs> on and so rhetoric, forth, right? The diaper effect. <laughs> um, I mean, I think this is just the perpetual cycle of people valuing the status quo and people being resistant to adopting the new versus, mm. you know, other people or other moments where the opposite happens. So there is this like establishment of a trend and then the breaking away towards yeah. something new. Totally, totally. And then eventually the returning of the trend, right? I was watching the TV show in a different world last night from the early 90s and like Almost every outfit that Lisa Bonet and the other characters in that show were wearing, I could see my students wearing today. Like, it's all back in. 90s. Yeah, totally. It's all 90s fashion. Well, now. 90s and, and Y2K, yes, too. Yes, exactly. Which I honestly kind of really like. Yeah. I know. I like it, too. Yeah. Um, although your shirt today would say otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> But, okay, so you mentioned this sort of perpetual cycle of humans, like valuing the new. There's definitely an extent to which that's right. But the concept that fashion trends cycle is actually quite new because the very concept of fashion is quite new. You might think about fashion as something that's been around since the beginning of human society. But the mainstream view in the philosophy of fashion is actually that fashion is a pretty modern thing that emerges in the Middle Ages in Europe. Oh Are you ready? Oh my gosh, I, I want to hear about the birth of fashion in the Middle Ages. I'm just imagining <laughs> monks and scholastics oh my gosh. suddenly rocking, um, you know, like really short robes. <laughs> yeah, a slightly different story, but I did do a very deep dive into this. I read like way too much for this episode. I read three full books, and so I'm going to need to distill things quite a bit. But I'm going to be drawing here on the French philosopher Gilles Lipovetsky's 1987 book, The Empire of Fashion. Well, I'm ready because I did not read as much as Ellie for <laughs> this episode. And so I want to hear about fashion's empire. OK, so Lipovetsky said that there was no fashion in ancient societies because these societies did not value novelty hmm. in and of itself. What they valued was tradition. So fashion involves devaluing the past, right? Being like, oh, that thing mm -hmm. is out. And um, he uses, you know, the dated language here of, quote, primitive societies. <laughs> but he says that in these societies, and we could just say it like ancient societies, because all of them would count on his view as examples of this, have garments and ornaments that are fixed by tradition. And these garments are subject to norms that do not change from one generation to the next. He gives a few examples of cultures where fashion didn't exist. Although, like I said, he considers every culture prior to the Middle Ages in Europe <laughs> to be an example of this. Talking about being out of fashion in yeah. your own language <laughs> about fashion. Right. <laughs> so one is ancient Egypt, where both men and women wore the same tunic dress for nearly 15 centuries. And he says you see a mm. similar stability in fashion trends, probably not like 15 centuries, but at least many centuries where the same dress was worn over the course of many, many generations in ancient Greece, Rome, China and India. Yeah. So I guess the idea here would be that even if there is evolution, say, in the span of centuries, there wouldn't be evolution in the course of an individual's lifetime mm -hmm. that the individual would have to keep track of and think about yeah. in terms of dressing themselves. So Absolutely. that's out. Well, and there's actually not even evolution in over the course of centuries in his view, at least in, in the case of Egypt. You know, yeah. it took Millennia. 15 centuries. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then he says something happens around 1340 in Europe. That's like weirdly specific. Like, <laughs> it's not even like the 1300s. It's like 1340, 1340. on May 2nd. I know. <laughs> and what happens around 1340, perhaps on May 2nd, perhaps not, is that the same long flowing robe that was worn for both men and women in medieval Europe mm. was replaced by a doublet and light breeches for men and a long dress for women that was more closely fitted and low necked than the garment that they'd been wearing before. And so one of the things that this does is introduces a more pronounced difference between male and female fashion. Male fashion, he says, predominated initially. And then women's eventually took over. So we associate fashion, I think, for the most part with women in contemporary society. But actually, initially in the Middle Ages, it was more men's styles that were changing, like the doublet and light breeches were oh changing God. over time. I knew I was born in the wrong 
century. I, I could see you really rocking some, yeah, some I, breeches. The breeches, the tight yep. breeches. Yes, mm -hmm. come on. And, and the doublet. What, what even is a doublet? Okay, you are asking the wrong person because when I think of the word doublet, I think of Foucault's analysis of the, oh, the historico the, the whatever analytic double man's man as a double. Something. I, we're both like Foucault readers, and we don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but so so yeah, like there were these innovations that spread rapidly throughout Western Europe post 1340. So between 1340 and 1350, suddenly like nice. fashion is becoming a thing, and things are starting to change. There's novelty being introduced, and that novelty never ends. Fashion changes for a long time, he says, were simply associated with nobility. And then their styles trickled down. So it would be like the the nobles setting the fashion trend of the year or the decade. So this is really interesting to me. And I will want to return to it later. This kind of downstream flow of fashion from, the, let's say, the nobles to the lay people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it seems as if there is the notion that the lay people maybe in order to gain social standing or some form of cultural capital, then try to imitate royalty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, which reminds me of how uh, Marie Antoinette was a major trendsetter in totally. her day when it comes to fashion. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and a very clear top-down flow mm -hmm. of information. Yes, but then things take another turn in the middle of the 19th century, because here we see the rise of haute couture. Paris fashion starts to value the designer as a genius. So it's not just like about a tailor working with a particular client to figure out the color and, you know, ornament that are going to highlight their bodies the most. <laughs> um, it's now about like the designer having a vision. You also get the rise of seasonal fashion shows mm -hmm. twice and then four times a year. And you also get an emphasis on the feminine nature of fashion. Like the femininity of just having a concern for garment. Is that what you mean? Well, well, fashion becomes more about women, right? Because okay, the, the see, designers are designing things for, for women. women. Haute couture is, a, is basically a feminine enterprise. And in the 19th century, on the other hand, for men, you get the rise of a more uniform style of workwear, you know, like the suit. And it's really interesting to think here about the effect that this seasonal approach to fashion, especially high fashion, haute couture, might have had on fashion itself because suddenly what you bought last season is out of style yeah. sort of automatically and you can expect it to no longer have the same social and cultural effect as when it was in season. And again, not because there is anything wrong with it, but simply because there is a new collection that's been put out by the designer mm -hmm. that throws a new style in the mix. So it just makes it change at a constant rate. Yeah. And that change becomes part of the definition of fashion, which again, it would be the trend. Yeah, and then these styles get disseminated in fashion magazines and the popular press. So there's also the rise of the fashion magazine and a new visual economy where people are seeing the trends in mm. these venues and then wanting them for themselves. And this is where we really get the idea of the novelty that is so essential to fashion, as well as the sheer ephemerality of it. Lipovetsky emphasizes that fashion is essentially ephemeral. Trends are constantly coming into being and passing away. And now you see that the seasonal approach with the rise of these fashion magazines and the popular press is inherently related to the category of the masses mm -hmm. or the people. It's not just the purview of the wealthy who can afford that designer dress that yeah. qualifies as uh, haute couture. So now I think about my local store, like a Uniqlo, for example, yeah. that even though it, nobody would call that high fashion because it doesn't have the designer appeal and it doesn't have the high price tag, it still has a seasonal organization. So they've built that ephemerality even into these more affordable mm -hmm. spaces. Mm -hmm. So in the store, they they have their their season, right? Yeah. Um, and they also do partner with high fashion companies too sometimes, and they'll have like Uniqlo times, like somebody fancy. <laughs> but okay. I, but I, yes, I think yes. your, your general point, absolutely right. Like Uniqlo is basic fashion, but still they're going to have their seasonal colors, their seasonal cuts, and yeah. so on and so Various forth. Various shades of white yeah. in their case. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so this is exactly right, David, because this is the last piece to Lipovetsky's historical account. In the 1950s and 60s, we saw the fall of haute couture and the rise of ready-to-wear clothes. A lot of this had to do with the rise of youth cultures, like the mods in swinging London or rock and roll culture. And here, the 1950s and 60s, fashion becomes less about wealth 
and more about youth, which you totally mm, see today, yes, right? It's yes. all about like, what are the young people wearing? You know, from our yes. Gen Z episode that I'm kind of obsessed with, like figuring out what Gen Z thinks is cool. And <laughs> what Lipovetsky says about this is that girls used to want to look like their mothers, but now their mothers want to look like them. Yeah. Exhibit A, Ellie wanting to pass for a Gen Z or <laughs> like fashionista in her mid 30s. <laughs> fashion gets denigrated, I think, is because there's an aspect to it of playing dress up. So I don't want to just wear a dress. I want to look like Audrey Hepburn or Rihanna or a modern day version of the goddess <laughs> Athena. <right? laughs> yes. Modern day, you just want like the tunic, the gender neutral tunic of the Greeks. Oh, exactly. I peaked when I played the role of Athena in my high school play. You and then we're just that. like, why am I meant? That's so embarrassing. That's like, I can't believe I mentioned that before. Uh, okay, uh, moving on. Maybe that's maybe that's why I thought of the goddess Athena. That was like literally not on my radar as I thought of that example. But now I'm realizing uh, that is why. Okay, anyway. But I think the point here is that fashion involves an element of escapism. Like, I might not be able to afford a mansion in Beverly Hills, but I can swan about in a silk robe I bought from a vintage store like an old Hollywood star all the same. So there's this element mm -hmm. of, of being able to tap in to a different kind of class or a different vision of wealth. And there's also an element of being able to tap into a past, right? Like the old school screen glamour or ancient Greece or something like that. Yes, yeah, living your best other class fantasy yeah. <laughs> or your anachronistic fantasy as well. Now, I agree with you that that escapism seems to be baked into the very concept of fashion because we become slightly a different person by wearing different clothes because we register differently in public space. The problem is that this escapism is made possible only by material relations of production and distribution of apparel that are fundamentally exploitative. Yeah. So our fantasy mm -hmm, comes mm -hmm. at a high cost. Most of the clothes that we Americans buy, they are manufactured in horrible conditions in the global south, in sweatshops that have very punishing working conditions and sometimes zero protections for the workers. Yeah. And most of the time, this happens in countries that actually see very little of the profit that the global north makes on the massively profitable fashion industry. Mm -hmm. There is a really famous essay in political theory by Iris Marion Young called Responsibility and Global Labor Justice, where Young is trying to understand how relations of justice and duty and obligation can apply in situations where people are connected in some way, especially by these capitalist flows of mm. goods and commodities, but where they live in different political and national jurisdictions. So what do I owe, for example, to the person that produced the clothes that I'm wearing right now, let's say, in the north of Mexico? And she develops a theory of global justice precisely by offering an analysis of sweatshops that are tied to the fashion industry. And she argues that what can ground a global conception of justice is not political jurisdiction again, but precisely that we are tied by these relationships of oppression and exploitation and benefit and privilege. And I think that the reason that she chooses fashion sweatshops to make this argument is because we willingly accept products that grow out of exploitative practices, even when it is merely to satisfy what I think we can all agree are artificial and secondary needs, um, you know, like wearing the latest trend. Yeah. And so maybe all fashion involves definitely an element of escapism, but I would say it's also an escapism from the very conditions of the production of fashion mm -hmm. because we don't want to look at that. Yeah, yeah, because fashion is definitely one of the most exploitative industries in human civilization, both from the perspective of working conditions and also from the perspective of the environment. And so you're absolutely right, and this is such a key point, because the clothes that we play dress up in appear in modern society to have sprung up out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And this obscures their often very violent 
origins. I think today when you see this proliferation of what's known as greenwashing, for instance, of like, look, this is sustainable linen or like, you know, made in America, not in a sweatshop type of thing. It's sort of just like a pat, like, don't worry, you're doing okay. But then the consumer just gets to go about living their everyday life, still not really caring, not worrying about it. Right. And so Mm -hmm. in preparation for this episode, I read this book called The Anti-Capitalist Book of Fashion, which points out that the fashion industry is adept at hiding the human labor behind its wealth and power. And the ultimate problem here is capitalism itself, which demands constantly new products all the time and puts such an emphasis on the object itself Mm -hmm. that there's a sense that the object is completely divorced from its material conditions of production. So fast fashion brands like Shein can create hundreds of styles per day and then they appear to consumers as like this cute item that sprung up (laughs) out of Mm -hmm. nowhere. And then there's this constant production of false needs, a false need specifically to stay with the times because of the novelty and the yes. ephemerality. Yes. And yeah, two things. One is that this emphasis on the object that you point to, it's not just that you need to have the object, but that you need to have the object new right when it comes out. Yes. Right? Because then when you hand something down, it loses that status. Yeah. And the second point here is the ephemerality. The thing about the ephemerality of fashion is that it keeps the industry running, but it also places very specific psychic or psychological burdens on individuals, especially those who value fashion and who Mm. want to be up on the latest trend. Because it means that I, as an individual, have to spend a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of energy on keeping track on all these changes in order for me and for my look to remain relevant. And so fashion is not only an extremely exploitative industry, but it's also a very demanding schoolmaster for those who who follow it and want to study it and want to embrace it. I'm feeling personally attacked. That that was actually an overt but- attack against you, <laughs> Ellie. I'm looking at you because we are in the same recording studio and I'm looking at your outfit. That was a personal attack. <laughs> well, I'm so glad that you bring this up because I think One of the things that doesn't get talked about that much in, I don't know, like discourses on fashion is the element of perception. And this is actually what I find Mm. to be maybe the most fascinating aspect of fashion, because the question of how we have a felt sense of what's in style or not in style appears quite mysterious to me. And I've been wondering about this a lot recently because I went from feeling confident in my perception of style to being totally at sea now that there's like the introduction in the past couple of years of Gen Z fashions that remind (laughs) me of what I was wearing in middle school. I see. Like I went from feeling like I had an intuitive sense of, oh, that's cool, to now being like, I have no idea what is cool and what is not cool. And I've been like trying to train myself to to see things differently. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny because I know this about you because the last time we went shopping for clothes, you told me this, that you felt like you've, you'd lost your edge about fashion. And I, I do think it is a problem of perception. I mm-hmm. mean... Um, The thing about this is that I'm actually on the opposite end of this because I am convinced and I sort of approach fashion in this way when I want to look fashionable, which nowadays is less and less frequently. I am convinced that I can play the part of the fashionista successfully simply by wearing clothes assertively that I see young people wearing rather than by perceiving what is in style in the culture more broadly. So I don't want to perceive and I don't want to interpret. I just imitate and do so assertively and I'm good to go. Yeah, see, I feel like in order to do that well, I need to be able to know how others are going to see me, which is itself already problematic because others have different opinions and different perceptions of this, right? Like not everybody has one single homogenous sense of like what is in style, but there does seem to be this dominant cultural zeitgeist that like you have to tap into in order to be stylish because then what that allows me to do is say okay so this is the style i can like do a tweak on it and then i'm being really stylish and i think this is what so this is what gives the lie to the fashion is self-expression view 
to my mind, because I think our clothes are always communicating something to others beyond what we intend for them to say. Like if I feel from a first person perspective that my button down shirt is in style, but my students are like, oh, that's not the right cut of button down shirt. Then they're seeing me in a different way than I intend to present myself. And this is the perceptual or we might broadly say the aesthetic dimension of fashion. Mm. Some people have an eye for it and others don't. And young people often have more of an eye for it than older people. Well, that would be true according to your genealogy of the history of fashion only in the post-1970s yeah. and 80s world. Po- post-1960s. Where, yeah. uh, post-1960s world where fashion becomes about the self-definition of a youth culture mm-hmm. and the creation of a boundary between that and other youth cultures and the, the parents, essentially. Yeah. But I do think there is a difference here because it seems like you're looking for an experience when you look at fashion. You're looking for that intuitive kick yeah. that tells you I'm safe in the space. Exactly. To be honest, I don't think I've ever had that. And so huh. I don't look for it. I've never felt as if I am a trendsetter, yeah. but I have always felt as if I can easily imitate a trend and pass for a trendsetter. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, but I, and maybe that's better, right? Because then, like, the problem with this perception is that trying to keep on top of it is help feeding the beast of, like, this mm. awful fashion machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, just to give you an example, I recently bought a corduroy bucket hat only because I've been seeing them a lot on TikTok. And, you know, if uh, like, four years ago, I would have been like, that's hideous, yeah. a bucket hat. Now I love my now, bucket hat. Now it looks cute to you. Yes. See, that's it. Yes, and it looks cute, but again, it's not because I perceive something in it, and it's not because it gives me a sense of intuitive certainty or confidence. It's simply because I know that other people comment on it, and they're like, oh, that's super cute. And so now I wear my corduroy bucket hat with my, like, thin bad bunny sunglasses. (laughs) But, you know, again, it's for me, it's copying. There is nothing deeper. And I'm okay with that because I don't care enough to develop that interior feeling for it. So you're saying that you're not feeling like this corduroy bucket hat is cute from like a subjective perspective. You're only inferring that it's cute because other people are telling you that it is? No, not quite. I I would reverse the temporal sequence here. It's that it's not that I see it as cute and then decide to wear it. It's that I decide to wear it. And then once I incorporate it into my way of life, then I come to see it as cute. And that's just how I've always approached clothes. So then I would argue that you are developing this eye, this perception. You've trained your aesthetic perception to see these things as cute just through like other means, right? By, By means of others. And so this is what I've had to do with the recent resurgence of Y2K fashions. Because the weirdest thing is about those fashions is that I used to think they were cute when they first emerged, right? The low rise wide leg jeans, the little crop tops and uh, crop tops have been in for a while, but like it's a certain new kind of crop top. Right. And then I came to see them as hideous. Hideous. (laughs) Hideous. <laughs> and now culture has pressured me to see them as cute again, yeah, yeah. which, by the way, I'm all for because fashion just is these changing styles. So I'm not on a high horse about it, even though I definitely would want to stop short of like way too much consumption because of the you know nature of the fashion industry. I'm not yes. I'm not like counseling that mm-hmm. level Buying of conspicuous consumption. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I'm, I'm not on a high horse about like, hey, this is the trend now. Let's get back into it. Yeah. And I have a question for you on this point. I assume you've seen White Lotus season two. Of course. Okay. I stick with the television fashions. Okay. So there is the young assistant, like the young woman. Portia, thank you. And she wore really outrageous outfits throughout the season. Turns out people couldn't agree about whether her outfits were fashionable or absolutely (laughs) hideous. And the New York Times published a piece calling them chaotic, which is like, I guess, neither positive nor negative. Somewhere yeah. Between, maybe slightly negative. But I'm curious about that. Did you like her outfits? Yeah. They were so fun. Okay. Me too. And I like them precisely because they are chaotic and unapologetic. And I think that's how I approach fashion myself. I just choose things that look a little bit incongruous. Okay. And I, again, I think I expect people to then just recognize that as as fashionable. Yeah. Um, again, not necessarily because they do or don't represent a certain trend, 
But I thought that's what was so good about Portia's fashion, that they were amazing precisely because they were chaotic. Yeah, but I think you can't deny that Portia's clothes were fun because they are the apotheosis of Gen Z trends right now. So, And I think the backlash against them has to be understood in this way, too. I think the backlash against her outfits was classically millennial. Yes, like the yes. millennial eye wasn't able to see her clothes outfits as cute because they're so different from what's been in style and now I, th I think if you look back on her clothes in a couple of years it will they will seem more normal right and this is the very nature of fashion right to bring about the new and obviously as we've talked about this has problems because of capitalism but it also seems weird to my mind to like neg the trend rather than the very structure, which is that trends yes, are yes, novel. Yes, yes. No, and I, I think that's right that the opposition that I saw to Portia, now here as a stand-in for uh, new fashion, mm -hmm. came up from my millennial friends. Yeah. Um, it, who obviously cannot keep up with the ephemerality of fashion. And it's just a further piece of evidence that I am the true Gen Z <laughs> millennial fashionista because I could keep up with it. Okay, interesting pivot from your earlier perspective, <laughs> David. Um, I'm all over the place here. <laughs> but I think this is why older people tend to value style over fashion, because one of the things that I've noticed as I've gotten older is that I basically have something in every fashion category that I need. And so the idea of, for instance, buying new workout pants because the trends have changed strikes me as wasteful because I have perfectly good workout pants for the moment. And so I think older people... Lululemon, I assume. Oh, actually, no. Girl, <laughs> Girlfriend Collective, a very millennial brand that's now a little maybe dated, but still really cute. But what happens, I think, as you get a bit older is you get fatigued by fashion and like your closet's mm, kind of yeah. full, right? And so you eventually end up becoming more interested in style. Although I want to be careful about this because I do think that clothing that we call classic or like, oh, great personal style is also still often fashionable. The line between style and fashion is is blurred, right? Ooh, maybe yeah, style yeah, could yeah. be another episode topic. Yeah, it would have to be an entirely different one. But you know, at the end of the day, we're all born naked and the rest is drag <laughs> slash fashion slash style slash apparel slash oppression. <laughs> I would feel remiss here in not just mentioning my friend Amy Zimmer, who recently wrote an entire dissertation on philosophy and clothes and thinking about the role of clothes in the history of philosophy. Ooh, go so, Amy. I know. So I know we're talking like more about style than clothes specifically, but I think there would be some interesting overlaps here. There's also a recent book called Fashion Sense on Philosophy and Fashion written by Gwendolyn Grewal, who shares an amazing anecdote I want to tell you about okay. because it's about Machiavelli. And I think it, it <laughs> actually so helps. Unexpected. I know, but I actually think it helps put our conversation in perspective. On a December night in 1513, Machiavelli wrote a letter to his friend about how he changes clothes to read ancient texts. He writes, here's a quote, <laughs> At the door I take off my clothes of the day, covered with mud and mire, and put on my regal and courtly garments, and... Decently reclothed, I enter the ancient courts of ancient men, where, received by them lovingly, I feed on the food that alone is mine and that I was born for. Okay, I guess I need to start matching my outfits to my reading. You gotta get a <laughs> doublet, like, yeah. David, for the <laughs> medieval readings. Yes, I, I need to put on my alb uh, when I read St. Thomas Aquinas <laughs> um, or some of the early Christian fathers. Um, I need to get, what, what were they called? My um, tr my breeches and my trousers yeah. when reading maybe the German romantics. Uh, I mean, um, I don't know if you know this about me, but I love a nightgown. I love like a long flowy nightgown. Oh, nothing better to read philosophy <laughs> in than a long flowy nightgown like on your couch with the windows open and the birds chirping. And you are wearing a turtleneck now, which means that today is your existentialist day. Yeah. <laughs> Although it's a white turtleneck. It a is lot a more, white turtleneck, A lot yes. more Foucault than, um, mm. than existentialist. What would you wear to read Machiavelli? Well, since he's all about power, I would just wear an amazing BDSM suit. Speaking of Foucault. <laughs> If you're enjoying Overthink, please consider supporting the podcast by joining our Patreon. We are an independent, self-supporting podcast. And as a subscriber, you can help us cover our key production costs, gain access to our exclusive digital library of bonus content, and more. At the turn of the 20th century, in 1904, the German philosopher and sociologist George Simmel most well known for his work on the concept of money, among other things, published an article in the journal International Quarterly, 
titled Fashion. Just fashion. We love a one, succinct title. One word title. And in it, he argues that fashion is the social practice that perhaps more so than any other channels or exemplifies the two forces that shape human nature and human life, which are our drive for what he calls social equalization okay. or imitating and resembling those around us in order to create community and our drive for relentless individuation. Fashion differentiates us as individuals, yet obviously nobody has their own private fashion. So he says fashion falls somewhere in between because, again, it is about fitting into a larger trend, mm -hmm. but also about expressing that personal uniqueness mm -hmm. that we all think we carry within. So we might say in response to Wittgenstein's claim that there is no private language, that there is no, no private, private fashion. fashion. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I like this a lot because I think it helps put into perspective some of what we were talking about earlier about how self-expression can't be the whole story with fashion because mm -hmm. of the nature of fashion as involving novelty and like a certain eye, right? As opposed to say style, which I would say like requires a little bit of a different eye. But so how does he work this out, right? Because I think somebody could come back and say, well, that seems really paradoxical. It's this drive for individuation. And yet it's also this drive for, what did you say, equalization? Uh, social equalization. Okay. So yeah. How does this get worked out in his view? Well, the answer in short is class, which is central to Simmel's interpretation of oh, fashion. Yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So basically, fashion allows members of the higher class to identify with one another and to differentiate themselves as a class from everybody else. And this echoes what you said earlier, Ellie, about how originally fashion does flow downward from the nobles to, to the lay people. Mm -hmm. And so for Simmel, the thing about fashion is that it doesn't address obviously any real need. In that sense, he differentiates fashion from clothing. Okay. Clothing you need, fashion you don't. Yeah. And here we need to think about fashion as, you know, these aesthetic trends that are enforced through social pressure and that have nothing objective about them and that change all the time. Ultimately, the reason that humans have fashion, according to him, is because the upper class have a vested interest in distinguishing themselves from the lower classes and using external markers to police that class boundaries. And what happens is that this separation of the classes through fashion sets in motion a certain dynamic where suddenly the lower classes want to copy the upper class, either to gain respectability within their own class or to try to like climb the social ladder. And at the same time, the higher classes start changing their fashion in order to maintain their distinction from the lower classes. So basically, the rich keep changing their fashion intentionally precisely so that the poor won't be able to keep up. And this type of argument about class could be used to support, say, school uniforms. The idea being that variations in dress among students reinforce social stratification, mm -hmm. whereas uniforms promote equality. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, you know, to go on record here, I am a supporter of school uniforms for children because I do think that kids are inculcated into a very pernicious form of classism from a very early age precisely by learning to develop judgments about fashion and clothes, about how expensive and how good the clothes of their peers are in the classroom. Although I would counter as somebody who went to an all-girls private high school in Los Angeles that had uniforms, that we still found ways to differentiate our fashion. <laughs> and it, at school, it was socks. Did you have juicy socks? You had to have them from the juicy brand. <laughs> oh, um, oh, the brand. I was like, yeah. hey, what's a juicy sock? Yeah. Um, what is your jewelry? At the time, it was Tiffany, which is now totally back in style. Speaking of Gen Z, you know, those little like bracelets and stuff. And it was our lunch bags. The popular lunch bag to have was a shopping bag from a designer store. Oh, God. So we would come. It's like Sephora like was Chanel. OK. But yeah, <laughs> Chanel or like Prada, Ferragamo to go back to Arendt's favorite shoe brand. That was what you needed. Yes, and. It I don't think that school uniforms are going to erase the class consciousness of <laughs> a bunch of girls in a private school, school in Los in Angeles. LA. I oh, know. Yeah, I know. I know. But so I think like there's no doubt, right, that that fashion is importantly related to class. And 
the the view that you're describing here from Zimmel is actually a really common view in the philosophy of fashion I found in my extensive research. And it starts with Herbert Spencer and is also seen in Marxist approaches. It's also precisely the view that Lipovetsky is disagreeing with in The Empire of Fashion, the book that I mentioned earlier, huh. where he talks about medieval period as like being the origin of fashion. So Lipovetsky thinks that the view that fashion develops on the basis of class distinctions doesn't capture what's so particular about fashion. He worries that there's not enough focus in that account that you just gave from Zimmel on the aesthetic dimension of fashion or on the aspect of individual choice. So if the upper classes simply wanted to stay one step ahead of the lower classes, we wouldn't need a zillion different varieties of designer handbag or shopping bag as lunch bag each season. We would need just one or a few to distinguish the upper class Mm. from the lower classes. Okay, I see. I'm not, let me think about that. I don't know that I agree, but I want to articulate why. I'm not sure what Simmel himself would say about this, about this argument about the aesthetic dimension of fashion and individual choice, but it is possible that the exorbitant number of choices that are available to the higher class when it comes to fashion is meant precisely to give members of that class a sense of individuality relative to one another while ensuring that they still can have a sense of separation from everybody else on account of the prohibitive cost. Mm -hmm. So if there were only one fancy handbag, the scarcity of the commodity would be deeply at odds with the self-understanding of the class as a whole, which takes itself to have a right to excess just by virtue ah, of being wealthy. Okay, um, that's a great point. Yeah, So, but again, that's my argument. I don't know what Simmel would say about that. And it has to do with the quantity of commodities and not so much with the aesthetic dimension. So what exactly is Lipovetsky's argument about that? So the aesthetic dimension has to do with how we admire previous eras of fashion. He notes, and I I think he's right about this, that we're basically able to appreciate all eras of fashion except the most recent one, which we find hideous. So, you know, 10 years ago, we would have thought that Y2K fashions were hideous. Like, I couldn't believe that I had been wearing these low-rise jeans once skinny jeans were all the rage. But I could look back at all previous eras of fashion and be like, oh, wow, you know, there was something to 90s fashion, grunge. There was something to 80s fashion, like fun neon colors. Both of those, for instance, were in style 10 years ago. And so, like, all different areas of fashion we can appreciate. We might appreciate different aspects of them, right? The 90s trends that are in in 2023 are different from the ones that were in in 2013. But in 2013, fashion from 2003 was horrifying. And now fashion from 2003 is cool, but 2013 fashion is horrifying. Yes. Okay. So let me think also about this because I still want to defend a Simmelian. Is that the right adjective here? I don't know. I'm not a Zimmel scholar. Um, Yes. um, A Simmelian class-based approach to fashion because it really resonates with my my own relationship to it. So on the one hand, this idea of venerating and honoring the past is fundamentally conservative, and it is something that you see across various areas of culture when it comes to divisions between the higher and the lower class, the notion that the lower classes don't have respect for tradition or for the past and that they don't have appreciation of objects of culture um, that are not in the present. That's usually a stereotype. What's more interesting to me here is this idea that for the higher classes, we respect all the previous eras except the most recent one. Now, remember that for Simmel, there is this kind of battle where the upper class creates a certain trend. Slowly, it starts trickling down to other social classes who start replicating it over time to the point that they do start claiming it as their own. And it's precisely at that point that the upper class will change the rules of the game by creating a new fashion. And so the idea that you diss the latest fashion would make perfect sense from a Semelian perspective, because that's the fashion that recently Mm. the lower classes got their hands on. Ah, that's a super interesting point. And this raises for me a broader issue about the relationship between fashion and temporality, because what you're alluding to here is the way in which we relate to the past, to the deep past through fashion. 
But I think we also should think about how fashion conditions our relationship to the present. And here again, I'm going to lean on Simmel because according to him, what fashion does is that it gives us a very powerful feeling of the present. When you can wear something that is in fashion, you inhabit the present more fully because you feel a kind of organic synchronicity between you, your body, your clothes, and the times. Ah, uh, yes. You know, especially in a world where it's all changing so fast, if you manage to ride the crest over and over again, like jumping from the top of one wave to the top of another wave, you are sort of like a subject of the present. Dude, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm always trying to do that. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not necessarily proud of it, but I am always trying to do that. Yeah, and you said you're recently drowning at the, bow at the no, bottom I, of the ocean. I think I've recovered. I okay. think it was like it was like more a couple years ago, coming out of like quarantine, that I was struggling. Uh, yeah, and so Simmel maybe, maybe others would disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen that meme of the girl that's like drowning, um, and you're like, everything is fine. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> but. Sybil makes this really interesting argument about how we become temporal agents through fashion, but only if we can, again, ride the crest of those waves that keep crashing. And this means that people from the lower classes are denied a kind of, let's say, temporal justice. I'm not sure how much I want to hold on to that claim for the, for the time being, but they are denied full participation in the dynamics of the present, in the cultural present, to the extent that they are forced to live, to some extent, in the past, because they don't have access to what is in right now. So in a sense, the lower classes are sentenced to live their lives out of fashion, meaning that fashion produces a class asymmetry in the very experience of intersubjective temporality. Well, and this is why you see a lot of people defending consumers of fast fashion on the grounds that fast fashion has enabled people of lower socioeconomic brackets to mm -hmm. access trends at the current moment. So I actually wonder to what extent this would still hold true today, because for better or for worse, and in many ways, obviously for worse, Shein and Forever 21 and H&M have made contemporary fashions accessible to people across the socioeconomic spectrum. And the problem there, of course, is that it's like, worsening the capitalist the, yes, working exactly. conditions for people yes. in the global south. But many make the argument that when we're talking about poor people in the U.S., fast fashion has actually been a boon to them. So it's not as simple as like somebody who lives in a fancy brownstone in Cobble Hill saying we must buy only stuff that's ethically and sustainably made, you know, in the local workshop, because that stuff is like $300. Yeah, no, exactly. And so questions about here, access to fashion translate into questions about access to cultural time, which is really interesting to me as somebody that right now feels very much out of sync with the time given my <laughs> outfit. <laughs> which is, by the way, not that bad. It's just that the cut and is like, it's just a little dated. Yeah, it's fine. I am currently living my working class fantasy <laughs> of living in the past without access to the immediate present. I don't know if I would give that to you, David. You're wearing like a nice looking 100% cotton button down. From a thrift store. Okay. And, okay. A, and pants from a thrift store. <laughs> We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can subscribe to our Patreon for exclusive access to bonus videos, live Q&As, and more. To reach out to us and find episode info, go to overthinkpodcast.com and connect with us on Twitter and Instagram at overthink underscore pod. We'd like to thank our audio editor, Aaron Morgan, our production assistant, Emilio Esquivel Marquez, and Samuel P.K. Smith for the original music. And to our listeners, thanks so much for overthinking with us.